everyone. So our next panel discussion is Artificial Intelligence and IP, New Frontiers and Challenges. And we have Nishta Kharab, the moderator for the session, to take this forward. Thank you, Mithali. Uh, welcome to everyone who has trusted us that we are worth listening to. We hope uh, we will do a good job at it. I can assure you that uh, this panel is worth listening to. Perhaps the reason being that they all are distinguished in the field of IP and AI, uh, and you will uh, you will hear from them soon. So the first uh, round would be about the introduction. Uh, I think I will take the name, and and perhaps the respective speaker can just wave a hand. We have Mr. Anup Jain, who is a leader in innovation and IPR, uh, and he works at Samsung Research, New Delhi. We have with us Jarek Slaw, uh, who is the Managing Director, Malaysia, and the Lead Council, Asia, uh, for Siemens Logistics. We also have our dear Kavita Gupta. She's a Senior Counsel uh, at Juniper Networks, and she's based out of Bangalore. We also have Mr. Ajay, Ajay, Ajay Panwar, who is a Senior Counsel uh, uh, at MasterCard. So he's the person you should direct all your questions about should you have any credit card issues? <laughs> Just joking. We have Shuchi Agarwal, uh, who is um, uh, who is the founder and a managing director uh, for IP Niti, a law firm. And last but not the least, uh, Mr. Garg Vyas. He's a he's a GM for IP Legal, and he works for Cummins India Limited. Myself. Um, I'm a general counsel for one of the companies in AI, uh, Sieve uh, Limited, and I'm also an uh, uh, arbitrator and mediator for international UN organization, which is FIPO, World Intellectual Property Ar uh, Organization. So without further ado, uh, let's start with our session. Just for the audience, we have divided our session into four segments. The, um, and I, uh, Kavita and I, and some of us have been listening to the first session. So we would try not to repeat uh, uh, talking about topics which have already been touched upon by our fellow speakers uh, prior to our session. And looks like it, the way we have divided our entire session seems to be totally different from what you have heard so far. So that's a promise. So let's begin with the first session, which is uh, more about understanding the uh, 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 inventory issues that, that are endemic to the whole AI space. So perhaps I can ask, uh, uh, maybe I should, I should request Mr. Anup Chen to talk about the inventorship issue in the space of AI uh, and share his views about it. Over to you. Uh, hi, Nishta. Uh, just uh, a little correction. Uh, I'll be talking about some of the tips to the inventors. Uh, I okay. think inventorship issue has been, sure. uh, will be handled by somebody else. Sure. So, Sure. So I, I should, okay, let me direct my question to Mr. Garg Vyas. Um, I think we, when we were preparing for this uh, uh, session, you shared about that you, that, that there's a, there's a Dabu's case that you would like audience to know about, and you would in fact like to interact with them on it. Uh, and when I asked you why, your response was that this will touch upon the uh, issue of inventorship in AI and IP. Perhaps, uh, how about you take this up? So you rightly touched upon a very important point and you know, this is something where even the patent offices across the globe have been in dilemma what to do, what not to do. So this uh, question of inventorship itself for AI related invention, rather I would say AI itself as an inventor, that is something has touched me a lot and I would like to share the classic case of Dabbles. So a couple of years back, uh, inventor Dabus filed an invention in European Patent Office, USPTO, and that's where the offices asked the inventor to file the statement of inventorship for right to grant a patent. For example, for USPTO, it is Form 7 and etc. And that's where they came to know it is not a natural person. It's AI itself. So the invention itself were filed by AI, artificial intelligence. And this is the first time USPTO as well as uh, European Patent Office received this kind of inventions where the inventor was not a natural person. So let me give you a basic background about what is Dabus. So Dabus is an artificial uh, intelligence system that's an AI system created by 
Mr. Stephen uh, Thaler. And this particular AI Davos is created for the very purpose of creating further inventions. So the sole purpose of designing or creating this particular AI Davos is that the, uh, the AI itself should create and report the new inventions in different areas. And that's where, you know, the whole world or rather I would say whole patent offices, I mean, developed patent offices like USPTO, EPO got confused or got into dilemma. And they, they, they have seen this first time. I mean, you know, the patents which are filed by other than the natural person, something which is AI. And well, if we talk about the invention, they were also very interesting invention. One application which was filed in Europe, uh, European Patent Office was related to beverage container. The, another application which was filed by Dabus in European Patent, uh, European Patent Office was related to fracture right signals. So, I mean, what I want to say is, you know, inventions were also important. And the inventor, of course, is not a natural person, but AI itself. And that's where a lot of discussions happened. But finally, I think uh, in the late 2019 only, European Patent Office given decision for rejecting the patent application for the whole reason the inventor was not a natural person. And same thoughts were, have been followed by the USPTO as well. So to start with the session, I would say, what will be the future? Are we going to allow this or not? And how we are going to tackle this in future? Because as we see, even the legal system, we are introducing a lot of uh, AI related aspects like Watson, IBM Watson is going to be the future lawyer for all of us. And that's where if something AI like uh, Watson is going to take decision on the inventorship for the patent application filed by another AI, which is Dabus, how we are going to safeguard and how we are going to tackle this. So with that, uh, I, I, you know, I open this forum for other participants to show their thoughts. Thank you. Thanks, Kurt. So Mr. Ajay, uh, so leads to a question of view, the issue of inventorship in, uh, in the field of AI, own experience uh, around the region that you can share. Uh, uh, it is more about whether the law is catching up with AI or use or in your perspective, the courts or the law are also become hence that they are trying to foresee uh, what is coming in future and the policies are reflective of what will come in future. So perhaps your view, are we doing a catch up game or are the courts are waking up and they can visualize the vision of future? Your perspective, please. The court's view on inventorship. In case yeah. Nishta, I can just take over the question because that's that's a very good point, basically how the jurisdiction, so m multiple regulators are looking at that subject. So basically, like, you know, we were all in the lockdown for the last year, but regulators were not, <laughs> especially for the mm -hmm. idea they all, all of the markets, they see that there, there must be some change and the change are taking place basically in the three dimensions. The first dimension is like how the regulators or the associations or respective authorities are, are handling the ethical subjects of the AI. Second subject would be how they handle liability aspect. And third one, how they handle also intellectual property rights. So I would say, I don't want to look historically at the 2019, 2020. We, we just like, basically there's, I would say, common denominator among the regulators that they all agree that there's, there must be certain human uh, oversight over the AI that must be ethical ground, that must be trustworthy AI development, ethics by design as the new concept that is coming from more data privacy, where it's always privacy that by design always, in, uh, that they try to influence also in the still non-binding one year, developers about ethics by design when we think about AI development and implementation. But however, what is the most notable regulation that have been regulation or the incentive that has been um, that is uh, that is worth noting is the in October last year, 2020, European Parliament has yeah, issued the proposal um, uh, the European Union Parla Parliament has issued the proposal how to regulate AI exactly in these three dimensions. This is very, I would say, um, groundbreaking regulations since basically it will trigger the whole legislative process in European Union, which means that European Union as the European single, um, single digital yeah, sure. market, they plan to 
regulate comprehensively the whole AI infrastructure, AI framework. It is very interesting because already in the proposal from October, there's a number of the ideas that have been already shared, such as, you know, um, following up on the previous aspect, whether AI can generate the intellectual property rights. The, the, the answer is that current intellectual property rights system is not yet ready, prepared for the, uh, how to address that. So basically what European Parliament confirmed is that AI will never have the legal personality. However, um, however, Till the moment when the intellectual property framework will be adjusted, we still need to rely upon the existing copyrights for the, either the companies who, are, who have uh, invented AI or for the for the natural persons who did it. In, interesting, the aspect is on the liability because that's where the um, maybe also to, to manage the expectation. These regulations are supposed to come into force in five years. So right now, the European Parliament understood that to strike the balance between facilitating the innovations and efficiency and really this nature-oriented performance of AI, they must also allow this transitional period quite long. I would say it's, it's surprisingly long, especially if you look at that, really how to also foster the trustworthy and the trust in the AI. So on the liability and on the intellectual property rights, they implement already a couple of the very interesting concepts such as, you know, um, liab uh, like strict liability for the, for the high-risk AI which means that operators both for uh, front and back end will take the strict liability, not fault based, but risk based. Uh, it, so which means even if there's no negligence, as long as AI has generated any damage to the, uh, any, uh, any damage either to the person or to the, to the property, then could be still liable out to the certain thresholds. It's so European Parliament even indicated 2 million euro for the threshold for the personal damage, for the, for the property damage 1 million euro, and with the limitation period of 30 years to going after the operators who are benefiting from the AI. On the ethical aspect, the distinction between high-risk AI has been also implemented. So, so European Parliament is looking at that, not just how to regulate the liability and uh, IPR aspects of the AI, but also how to make sure that developers already think in the future-oriented manner how they are going to already implement the, the trustworthy components of the AI in the future. So I would say everyone who is right now uh, involved in the AI, I would definitely advise to look at that uh, that proposal of the European Parliament because that would be basically the 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 the, um, <laughs> the groundbreaking um, I would say waterfall effect that we can expect. It is similar as we do in the data privacy. In data privacy, general data protection regulation was the first one to really start the water for effect in each and every jurisdiction. And honestly speaking, looking at the mark and looking how the regulators are following up, catching up, and really like communicating between each other, I, 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 I can suspect that it will basically also the future for the AI regulations uh, as the framework, as the legal framework on regulatory aspects, also for other jurisdictions. Chris, what you're trying to say is that, 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 uh, uh, this is not a cat. The regulators are uh, looking ahead of the impact that AI can have. And ethical space is of the course. one where they're pretty active. Am I right? Yeah. And, and, and I, I, the on the ethical aspects, yeah. That, that's that's perfect. If that, that's that's a very good summary. On the ethical aspects, there I would say they're running. I would, have, I would say they are few steps ahead on the regulatory aspects. They mm. already anti, they already indicated what will happen in five years, giving yes. this transition period for the, all of the developers yeah. to really right now already think right now how we can provide a robust system with all of the looking maybe starting from the ethical aspects that are I would say more soft in terms of the human oversight, transparency. Ex explicability traceability yes. non-discriminative you know there's a number yes. of of the of the already proven cases like amazon had who has implemented this recruitment yes. ai process that has discriminated yes. you know women against men for the for the uh, they, that was given up yes yeah? yes so just to add to uh, yes, Janice, uh, uh, mm. yeah just to add and i completely agree i think european union has been uh, forward when compared to other countries, uh, whereas other countries have also uh, released its strategic, um, you know, advisory report on AI. Uh, so a lot of countries, US, India, uh, Singapore, Malaysia, many countries have actually uh, issued the AI strategic, but yes, uh, European Union is a step ahead of it. And I think uh, uh, they are coming up with reports uh, reviewing their uh, uh, existing system on the uh, liability and uh, ethics. I think ethics is uh, something that is given 
uh, priority and importance, especially when it comes to privacy. Uh, and many countries have uh, actually come out with its report uh, on this particular aspect, wherein they call it as an AI strategic uh, uh, report. Uh, and I think one good thing about uh, Europe is that uh, they do uh, recognize uh, that the existing rules on liability which uh, uh, offer solutions with regards to the risk that is created by the digital uh, technology. The outcomes may not always may seem appropriate given the failure to achieve a fair uh, and efficient allocation of laws, in particular because it could not be attributed to those whose objectional uh, behavior caused the damage or who be, uh, benefited from the activity that caused the damage or who were uh, in control of the risk that materialized or who were the cheapest avoider or uh, takers of insurance. Uh, you know, just to add to what uh, Jerusalem has mentioned. Ajay, would you like to contribute as well to this discussion? Yes. Yeah, am I still audible? Uh, okay. No problem. Okay. Yeah, sorry for the glitches. And of course, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, any problem, any uh, you know, any starting problem is always yes. uh, ensure so no that, strict liability you know, you're on that doing good. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so basically, you know, uh, uh, we're starting with the quotes, and you know, ask you are you are asking a very good question about you know whether we are doing it uh, you know uh, uh, courts are doing it you know actively or you know they are catching up uh, basically you know uh, a basic question of uh, now started about the inventorship now uh, i will take uh, some brief timing about the type of uh, you know the ai inventions so you know AI, we can divide the ai invention in some parts like uh, uh, generic ai inventions uh, basically uh, which are very generative you know basically then we are applying the machine learning in the terms of you know uh, to the known problems so here basically uh, we are having a less human intervention moving forward then we are saying that okay we are uh, uh, using the uh, machine learning uh, to the to solve the new problems so naturally the human intervention will increase and ultimately when we say that we are developing the new mach machine learning models and we are making them compatible to talk to each other or to work with each other there is a greater human you know interaction so in such a way that uh, the level is increasing uh, from uh, the in less human intervention to a greater human invention so at this point of time we are uh, lying on a point where we say that there are invention where we are using ai so we call them cri computer related invention and the inventions where you know somebody has created a net you know the models and the models are in interacting they are getting trained and then they are giving the output of their own based on the learning they have adopted so which we are saying that where the ai is doing the work here the courts and uh, the policy makers and the patent offices of course have to think that uh, Till the patenting system has started, say from the you know 1560s in UK, then Magna Carta, and uh, you know later on all the constitutions and IP, and even in US in 1792, you know they have started with their patent office and everything. The main centering thing was the inventor, and inventor was considered as a human being because innovation was related to the activity or the use of uh, all the brain and the mind of the human beings but now having said that as we are discussing and coming up with the ai into the picture where you know all the models but uh, in my personal view to a some extent you can say the only question is uh, uh, the policy makers have to look from is whether the human intervention is very less or very more for example, uh, the only thing here is that, uh, you know, what we call in pharma is called a kind of evergreening. The problem could be like that. OK, if I have made something uh, or any inventor has made something and converted, you know, two models or something into that. And that now model is keep on doing the things, you know, over and over in a period of time. So does that inventorship 
only live with the initial people who have done it or now the things have become uh, the the models itself are becoming so intelligent that they are doing the things of their own but as i talk about that uh, human interventions the lesser human inventor and uh, interventions or the greater human intervention so basically uh, the policy makers and the courts have to think from that point of view because by saying that there would be no human intervention at all and there will be a no uh, you know uh, physical person and maybe then somebody may create a you know any artificial person or something like that and of course i think my follow up analyst will be talking about uh, more about that a person skill in the art in that case so courts have to start think from that because taking out the human element out of that it will be very difficult for any policy maker and courts to find out any kind of solutions because then there will be all together all kind of problems will arise right from the enforcement uh, uh, you know uh, all kind of uh, uh, you know liabilities and everything so and so forth because uh, on one side uh, the inventors who are initially with the very less human interventions uh, will be calling upon uh, that okay the right should always belong to them but on the other hand those people against whose those such rights will be enforceable they will be calling that their intervention was a limited one why they will be given something forever so that kind of uh, thank you mr ajay is there anyone else who would like to add on this because uh, uh, my view would be that you they uh, there has to be a liability that should be affixed to human because at the end of the day ai use is for humans and and if you fix a liability to a software what kind of uh, punishment are you thinking of in penalizing a software so um maybe that's the reason why singapore courts are also they rejected the whole idea that software on its own uh, can be uh, construed as, as as an entity for strict liability because ultimately the software originate it did originate from human intervention as you mentioned mr ajay and and at the end of the day it was used by humans for humans so um uh, i attended another conference where uh, author of uh, national university of singapore fixing a liability in um, in a driverless car so who should be liable if there is an accident should it be the one who is driving the car but there is no driver um the one who owns the car or the one who manufactured the car or the one who has installed the entire software in the car there are two different entities that makes that driverless car um and 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 it's an interesting question to answer almost in all the ai way can't fix one entity so perhaps uh, i can my uh, thoughts on that 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 it it will be unique uh, judgment if a court will say that a software per se is liable uh, so let me move on to the um, other segment and as you mentioned there are shuchi that would be for you mr ajay has set the stage for you where he said that we will be talking about um, uh, if there are any changes that are required in the definition of a person skilled in the art for evaluating uh, obviousness of ai related inventions perhaps that part will cover almost the the all the aspects that we're talking about in terms of challenges of ai sure thank you so much nish um, and in fact it's enlightening to hear the thoughts of each and every uh, co panelist um, and i'm and i hope that everyone who is in the audience is also having a good time um, hearing different thoughts about it so yes i think um, uh, ai has actually driven people uh, in circles still trying to figure out where exactly to catch up and how much or should we be proactive so like there are issues related to liability that we are talking about there are also challenges that people are facing increasingly when we talk about prosecution of the same and uh, this panel being decorated by stalwarts from companies uh, who themselves are leading in ai related invention um, i think it's uh, it's all the more easier to understand that ai today has entered every single technology arena uh you cannot say that ai is actually limited to only electronic manufacturing or mechanical you can largely say it has percolated in all domains so largely um how is it that we are talking about ai being such a big uh, problem uh, or posing challenges to grant of a patent 
Um, one of the criteria, uh, which is there and it is being harmonized because of TRIPS, in getting a patent application granted is that an application or an invention needs to overcome the bar of obviousness. In very, very simple layman terms, what that means is that we are talking about a parameter which has absolute subjective interpretation with a hope that the only objective how you define what is objectiveness or how a person skill in the art is going to be treated in a jurisdiction. So largely this bar is being introduced in order to get away from petty or so-called jugad innovations which really do not have a large quotient of human intellect in them and in order to differentiate from merit-based patents versus something which is let's say a normal uh, course um, and you're getting a patent out of it. So to overcome this bar of obviousness or to establish that your invention is non-obvious or has an inventive step, a criteria which is commonly known as a person skilled in the art parameter was being introduced to judge from those lens whether you should treat an invention as being obvious or whether it is non-obvious. Now, uh, largely because IP and in prosecution space is harmonized by TRIPS, which is an international treaty, uh, TRIPS only establishes that obviousness has to be judged from the eyes of a person skilled in the art without really uh, getting into the nitty gritties of defining who this person skilled in the art is. Because this is, it is given leeway to individual countries to define what and how they would like to define the same. So when I'm going to touch upon this, I'm going to talk about three leading jurisdictions as to currently what is the prevalent discussion around this or how do they follow this. So I talk about Europe, uh, US and India. Uh, I would say India and Europe largely follow a definition which is of a person skilled in the art as opposed to US which also has a term called ordinary introduced to it which is a person of ordinary skill in the art. Um, ordinary skill in the art, right? Uh, very quickly to touch upon the, uh, the definitions. So in US, when you talk about a person of ordinary skill in the art, typically the definition refers to a person who thinks along the line of con conventional wisdom in the art and is not the one who undertakes to innovate. Or he is a hypothetical person who is presumed to have known the relevant time at the time the invention was being made. This is a little different when I talk about the yardstick being used in Europe and India, which basically says in Europe, the definition or as being uh, presided by the EPC etc. is that a person skilled in the art is a skilled practitioner in the relevant field of technology who is possessed of average knowledge and ability and is aware of common general knowledge, which basically means this is quite different from what we're talking about as a yardstick in US, where all they're talking about in the expectation here is that you should have presumed what is known in the art versus having an expertise in a particular stream of technology, right? In India, largely, I would say they go hand in hand with what is the definition in, in Europe. And here also the courts at various points have said that a person skilled in the art is a person who has read the prior art, knows how to proceed in the normal course of research on the basis of what he knows uh, is the state of the art. So largely, we are talking about two contrasting definitions where one, the skill in the art definition is talking about a person having expertise. Now, expertise could be by way of practical exposure, uh, by having worked in the particular field for a few years, or having academic degree, uh, a higher degree like a PhD or a master's, having some specialization in that field. And this is exactly where it differs. Now, putting all this together in the context of AI, if we talk about AI, and if I have to put a very layman explanation of what AI would be, I am talking about humongous collection of data, chunks of data, which are being used in a computing environment to arrive at a defined result. I'm not getting very technical about it, but exactly when we talk about AI, we're talking about huge loads of data, which is being processed in a computing environment to come and reach a solution of what problem you've fed for. So now the problem exactly in AI and uh, definition of person skilled in the art is, while we are trying to define who a person skilled in the art could be for judging AI inventions, here we are talking about machines creating inventions. We are not talking about human beings creating inventions. So are we saying that the current definition where we are saying we need person of X skill with X number of years of expertise with this kind of a professional background, is he uh, adequate enough 
uh, to judge a per, uh, invention which is related to uh, uh, where where sorry we are judging the criteria whether the invention is obvious or not or are we saying that we need because we're talking about a machine certainly if we talk about it has got large chunks of data more than possibly even an average human being even if we talk about a skilled person in that area would have that kind of information chunks of data we are talking about here gigabytes of data that would be present in with the machine while processing in the computing environment to come up at a solution so is this sufficient enough as the yardstick to evaluate the same definition for a computer based invention where the entire invention is being generated by the machine and not by a human being who still compared to the uh, to the machine has limited amount of data available limited amount of computing uh, capacity available and therefore the outcome of the invention then you're talking about let's say what if if we don't revise this particular definition and we ex uh, accept it the way it is so we might land up and we still don't have enough evidence to prove the same but we are moving towards an area where we might end up seeing that there are too many patents being granted because we're talking about high computing systems which will be able to come up and generate new and new in inventions faster day by day what was being done 5 years back it took 6 months to remove that and then now 3 months etc so you would the date, the patent offices will be flooded with applications which will have incremental innovations to it having the same old yardstick where you cannot really enhance the same to it so how do you expect we would be possibly in a situation where we would have too many patents granted and if that be the thing then again all the other parameters that we were talking about liabilities the court setups how are we going to deal with that infrastructure have we thought about it how the next steps of dealing with those would be or should we nip it in the bud right now and say look let's have different definitions when we are talking about dealing with inventions where specifically the inventor is a human being let's continue with what is there but the moment we we switch to a ai related invention which is being derived by the computing capacity of a machine then in that case the yardstick to evaluate is going to be different but of course this also has lot of challenges uh, the challenge here is so one you would need different definitions for different types of technologies um, you would need people to be trained because at the end of the day you're getting a patent granted after a human being is examining those applications on merits so you are getting that person involved who again will have to think alike in that particular terms so i think uh, a lot needs to be debated a lot needs to be thought about um, how exactly are we wanting to move to the next steps um is a revision uh, in store i think yes it should be because the current uh, system or the current evaluation would not suffice a long way we might be left with a lot of frivolous litigations because if there are frivolous patents there would be trolls there would be people who are going to go in for litigations because they know the kind of damages you might end up seeing uh, some sort of uh, i would say disheartening for the small industries because that's a very big tactic all of us know to in order to curb uh, small players from really becoming big or reaching out international markets you flood them with a couple of litigations and that's it their game is finished they don't have deep pockets to fight you out So I think yes, it is time. And as the inventions, in fact, um, in 2018, uh, I think around 2,000 patents on AI were being granted by U.S. Patent Office. And year on year, it is picking up a lot. Previous to that, it was only about 500. So yes, um, I think there has to be a consideration in the definition of whether a person skilled in the art needs to be changed. And if yes, how does it need to change? Um, just a few thoughts of mine. Thank you so much. thank you so much uh, for giving uh, expert opinion for which you generally would have charged <laughs> <laughs> so so i just want the audience to know the value add of having you on board um perhaps um, we have touched almost uh, upon all the frontiers uh, in terms of the challenges that we foresee as a panel on this topic with the lim in the limited time that we were given um we had ethical issue with jaris law pick kavita uh, picked upon the liability part of it um and then ajay and garg uh, you talked about the other uh, aspects of ai especially the inventorship part and shuchi uh, picked on the uh, definition of obviousness and how uh, i think the the, the main message that shuchi was trying to give that perhaps the traditional laws of 
IP, they, they, they would require to undergo a sea change, but the challenge would be that people in IP field may not be also trained enough to, to pick up the vast majority of patent work that is coming through in AI. So now, Absolutely. yeah, so, so now with that, um, Anu, although you were the first person I directed my question to, can I ask now? Yeah. Uh, that which and, and I will read mm -hmm. as an in-house counsel, Kavita, um, uh, you, and and um, Jaris as well. Um, that that if, that what should be uh, what should be the strategy that we should have in our mind when we we have an AI-related product. So so how we should think about it? Like what is like we have already touched upon the the specifics of it, but talk us through about the strategies that we should keep in mind when we have an AI product on the table. Mm -hmm. Right, right. So, uh, Nish, uh, being a patent counsel, as well as an inventor who has filed a decent number of patents in the field of AI, uh, I was able to a couple of things which, uh, which are missing, in fact, and I have been experimenting with uh, those thoughts within my organization uh, for the effective uh, prosecution of AI related invention and one thing that we have found uh, which is very uh, important is uh, the inventor because most of the time when we counsel as a counsel discuss uh, and the most starting point for any invention for us is the disclosure that we receive from the inventors and what I have found that uh, keeping that disclosure as a base for, uh, to start with a journey of a patent uh it makes that disclosure very very important document uh for uh any future aspect of that particular patent so from the inventor's perspective um i see ai uh, as an opportunity uh for them to uh, basically express their thoughts in a better way and uh, i would like to share some uh of the challenges what we face basically from the patent office so if i generalize this whole thing so most common rejections that we face from the patent office is in terms of abstract idea is in uh, the form of the mathematical model or the pure algorithms. Uh, some of the patent office requires hardware requirement, uh, which like software should be supported with hardware uh, as in India. And almost all the patent office are rejecting AI based application uh, due to the obviousness criteria or inventive step criteria, because like I think, uh, Ajay did touch upon that uh, aspect initially that uh, whenever uh, we talk about AI, we see AI as three layer the architecture. One is the core AI, which talks about the algorithm and the component, the functional aspect of AI, like, for example, uh, image, pro uh, image uh, processing or NLP or something like that. And third is the application aspect of AI. So when we see this AI application, uh, we try to divide it into this three aspect, but on the practical side, uh, based on our experience, this there are only two aspects in AI. One is the core AI and other is the rest, be it functional or as application aspect. And there has to be a very separate strategy uh, for the kind of uh, inventions that you have, whether you are going for the core AI or you are going for the functional or application AI. So I will quickly brief you upon like how as an inventor, you could basically improve chance of your patent uh, being granted in any jurisdiction by overcoming some of these common challenges that I have listed listed upon. So, see, when I talk about core, I, in fact, some of us have been talking about inventorship issues. So, in general, most of the core AI-related applications are invented by human being because uh, most of the functional side is something that your AI system can come up with, but some human has to develop that system itself. So inventorship issue is not there in most of the core AI related application. So what an inventor should do in such case is try to describe that system or technique as the individual component and how that architecture has been designed or how that particular technique has been designed by combining those individual components. Like for example, if we take neural network as an example, so there are like thousands of thousands net, uh, such networks are available which have some minor changes in their layered architecture so those layers as an individual component should be described while explaining any invention and uh, the flow of information and data 
is very very important when you are describing such such individual components and the combination of uh, of them so how that information or data is flowing through this those components and what kind of operations are changing that information and data that has to be very well described and this is something that most of the inventor basically skip upon they do talk about the overall architecture but they never talk about how that information flow is changing uh, going through about that particular architecture so this is one very important thing uh, for core ai related invention also uh, is they have invented it and most of the inventors are very well aware of that particular field so in ai minor differences plays a very big role when we go on down to the prosecution so uh, differentiation from the state of the art whether they have referred uh, existing architecture to modify it or basically uh, they have designed something whole, whole uh, altogether new it's very very important to basically uh, for inventors to provide that the differentiation of course we as an attorney can do the prior art searches but uh, the hands on experience of the inventor plays very very important role while coming up with the uh, patent application another part is to identify the hardware dependency earlier it used to be like all the cpu based process we move to gpus and now we are talking about neural processing unit which are npus which will basically run this uh, kind of algorithms so the hardware dependencies over all three different platform has changed and uh, so does overall the pro overall processing of the uh, any ai based architecture so if this hardware dependencies could be brought into the overall explanation it will be very very useful um, for uh, this and one last point is does this whole ai system require any human in in intervention so i think uh, this is a very very important point to consider because earlier this has never been considered as a serious point we generally focus more on the technical aspect of it so human intervention should be described very well now talking about the second aspect of it which is functional and application ai this is where the most of the ai applications are being filed across the world uh, be it any application area like uh, healthcare fashion uh, like electronics like what we are doing all the finances so most of the applications are filed in functional and application based ai and most common rejection that we see is something related to like for example us 103 or obviousness or inventive step kind of thing because this is where you are just using some of the existing architecture and you are just applying a new kind of data to get a new kind of result so that uh, that is something that uh, creates a big problem uh, in terms of overcoming uh, 103 kind of uh, objections and rejections so uh, here in this case, the inventor could be human or it could be machine. Uh, I think you have already talked about machine aspects. So let me discuss more on the uh, human aspect. So uh, here in this particular case, don't just describe the function or application as an outcome of a black box that usually inventor prefers uh, to call it. That, OK, I have a black box called AI. I give this data as an input and I get something magical as output. So this is what creates one of the biggest challenges uh, to prosecute any application uh, out, out there. So uh, we should describe it uh, as the structural flow, uh, structural flow uh, in terms of uh, the combination of different system components, uh, describing what is most unique uh, about that particular application, why that application was not existing earlier, and uh, what this AI system, whether it is a black box over there, is making a difference in uh, terms of the output of that particular system so the output could be could have some unique characteristics which was not earlier observed and that could be a very strong ground to basically overcome some of the objections when we uh, talk about unexpected outcome or unexpected result uh, from the system and many uh, system uh, they involve the combination of different techniques it's not just one technique that they apply but the most common applications involve combination of different ai and other techniques so for such system try to see uh, why that combination that you have chosen is unique what is the impact of that particular combination over your end application and why any other combination is not going to work out in such scenario also describe uh, inventors can also try to describe the kind of challenges that they have faced combining uh, those individual AI components together 
and how they have overcome the, those challenges. Did they design some kind of interface for two separate AI components to work together? Or uh, there was a specific pre or post processing work that has been done after or before any particular component, uh, which is required for combining those components. This kind of things could basically bring up a very new, uh, a very important novel aspect uh, in the invention. And many times we have seen that the system as a whole may look very obvious, but when we focus on the minute level of these things, uh, they are like sufficient to get a patent granted uh, in that terms. And then link your solution approach to the end application and its impact on the application. That works wonder in mo most of the patent office. Also, um, like as I mentioned in the previous uh, part as well, that human in identify the human intervention and try to highlight that wherever any human intervention is needed, we should try to highlight them. And then the physical components, like what are the physical elements required to carry out the invention? For example, if there is any computer, hardware, sensors, the networking elements, or any other physical component which is required to carry out that particular invention that should be added, in fact, as a part of the claim for the successful prosecution. So see if your application is a very specific improvement in a very specific application field uh, in place of a generic approach that makes a big difference for a successful prosecution. So if this all this information could be provided to any patent uh, attorney by the inventors, uh, it makes uh, life of any patent attorney very easy. And in fact, uh, it could help them uh, making a very good strategy around the patent. Uh, because uh, probably Shuchi, as you are, uh, you might be working with different organizations. So one of the common challenges that we face uh, is that our interviews with Absolutely. the inventors are not enough. So until unless they have full disclosure and a proper disclosure, uh, that makes a big difference. So these are my two cents that I just wanted to share uh, here. If there are some inventors out there in this session. So yes. Very beautifully put, Anu. Very, very yes. beautifully put. And I think you've possibly even worded out the kind of problems we face when we work with uh, inventors who specially are doing AI a bit. Um, they typically don't seem to be uh, sometimes open enough is the word, or sometimes uh, they don't have even uh, the kind of write-ups they don't really have any of the aspects mentioned. So to grill and get that data out in order to convince them, look, this is what is required for patenting and not particularly for getting the invention out as a public disclosure is sometimes challenging. Very, very yes. beautifully put. Yes, absolutely. They can come to Shuchi. Uh, should they come to <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and if they want to have a co-ed interview, then they can go to Anu. And perhaps if you need help to Europe, they should go to Jaras Law. <laughs> and you can connect, connect them with the right people. So um, we are at 1.5. Maybe we are left with not more than five minutes. Uh, should we, uh, before I open, OK, One yes, should we go ahead? There is, there is a question. Um, I think oh. you should pick up the question from the audience. OK, yeah. uh, it should. So sorry, it sh is it at the chat? Yes, yes. yeah. Uh, Jared okay. had a captured Jared, question. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. One is related to Dabu's case. Uh, I'll read out yes. the question quickly. So yes. first of all, thank you so much, Gerard, for uh, you know throwing the question here in the panel. So the question says, uh, is the Deb in the Dabu's case, mm -hmm. what if the applicant just declare himself as an inventor rather than Dabu's? Do you think there will be any problem? After all, in AI-related patents, the human operators still have the final decision in the invention process done by the AI. Yes. So, uh, uh, you know, just to answer your question, uh, Gerard, here there are two things. First, uh, you know, the inventor itself. So in the case of Debus, uh, the developer of Debus, uh, Mr. Stefan uh, Thaler, has created Debus, but the invention which has been created are not by Stefan Thaler, but by Debus itself. So first is whether if you keep the name of Mr. Stefan uh, as an inventor, will it be a justice or will it, is he a true inventor or a right inventor? That is a question we have to answer. However, you know, the other side of it, if we do not keep invent individual inventor name or the person who has created the AI as an inventor name, we may end up losing the inventions being patented. 
that is what we have seen in the case of when rejection came for Dabus related invention in the Europe and the rejection came from USPT also for those patents. So we may keep ending up losing all these inventions if we do not keep the inventor as individual uh, natural person inventor. And hence, uh, it is advisable, even I also agree, and there are a lot of discussions happening in USPTO as well as US Congress, that why should not we put the creator of AI as an individual inventor, because that will also not conflict with any current statutes and current patent act, as we are keeping the name of a human person or a natural person as an inventor. So yes, there are a lot of uh, Karga, to your point uh, and even to Gerard's query, uh, you know, like I I'm not sure if we can actually see uh, when an AI itself is creating, uh, you know, a new invention. And Gerard's question was like, uh, when AI is creating a new invention, why can't we put the natural person who actually created that AI as an inventor? This is question. I mean, how would you prove that invention was created by that and by AI? Yeah, Kavita, and I agree with you. So that's why, you know, with current laws, until we see some good amendments in the current law, a natural person is one of the criteria, as we yes. rightly say. So that's why yes. we should we yes. should keep yes. inventor. But that yes. is also a question which is right now being discussed. Uh, all right. We have one more question. Uh, given the time, we can take this up. Uh, for startups using AI, do you recommend to file a patent? Or is it better to use trade secret? um uh in protecting the technology so looks like it uh, it's a question when you have a technology related product uh should you should you file a patent should you go for a trademark uh to protect the product or should you file it under trade secret shuchi would you yeah. like to take that sure, yes. sure, sure. absolutely so uh Jared, um i think one of the advice that typically i recommend uh to my clients and i would extend the same to you um i think rather than trying to decide at the upfront, whether a patent is required or a trade secret is required or a trademark is required, we need to understand a completely different facet. Exactly what do we want to protect? Uh, what is the regime that offers the corresponding protection? And then possibly come and evaluate what form of protection is fine for us. So what that particularly, particularly means, uh, we first need to have an understanding what protection does patent law extend? What is the protection that you get under trade secret? And then what is the purpose of getting a trademark? Once you have clarity about all the three, you would be able to evaluate better what exactly it is that you are eyeing to protect for. So in this particular case, uh, whether it is an invention by a startup or by an established company, uh, it's important to understand there is a purpose for having a trade secret protected. Now, trade secret is something that you can protect, which helps you in growing your business, but it is a protection that is extended to you as long as it is being kept secret. So what that means is, let's say you have come up with an algorithm to for the invention that you've developed and tomorrow by reverse engineering, I'm able to come up or arrive at something very, very similar to that. Exactly. This is now in public domain. There is no more protection left. And this is a valid point where independently without being influenced by you, I've been able to come up and arrive at the same solution. 
So something which is very critical for your business, would it work for you if this is out in the market because somebody independently took their own efforts to do it? Or whether you would want a monopolistic to some extent, it has its own checks and balances. You want a protection of that sort. If that be the case, patent is the way to go and not trade secret. If I talk about just the last bit, which is the trademark, trademark has a completely different function associated to it. Trademark, when you talk about, you're talking about putting a branding tag to you and identification for your customers uh, where the moment they see a particular mark, they know this belongs to you. So the, mo the moment you'll see double tick, you don't really need to know which company is it coming from, right? You know the shoes are from Nike. That's the kind of a purpose that a trademark holds. So largely you would be selling out the product by a particular name. You would be branding yourself. That is the facet that you would want to protect by way of a trademark. I hope I've been able to uh, answer to your question. Uh, with that, we come to an end uh, because having Mitali means that uh, our time has been uh, not up, but that we have we have done our job, um, uh, hopefully. Uh, so, so my last message would be that if if anybody in the audience would like to stay in touch with us, uh, they, uh, Mitali has our email address. Um, and we also have created a WhatsApp group, which is uh, a group of tech people. So once you contact Mitali, she can contact me and I can bring you over to the tech group that we have here. Thank you. Absolutely, absolutely, Nish. And thank you, everyone, the key panelists, for joining for the wonderful session and a very interesting question that is about the intellectual property and AI. So, which is, you know, uh, has something new every year. So, uh, it will be great to have you all here in this wonderful session. And I, I call the participants to join in and listening to them and also doing the polls in the poll section. So, we have created the polls where they can vote for this session. So now let's move forward for our expo time. So it's a virtual exhibition and networking tables time where you get the chance to meet our sponsors and partners. So we already have Suchi over here. So she'll be joining up expo and you'll get the chance to meet her and her law firm and also discussing and connecting with her. So uh, let's move on to the expo. So we are on the left. You can go to the expo and you will see different brands representing an expo and you them on one-on-one. -on -one. Thank you so much.